2017 is the 150th anniversary of the publication of Marx's great work, Capital, and the 100th anniversary of the now forgotten Russian Revolution, which no longer burns in the imagination of people as the desperate attempt to create a new world, however flawed the outcome. Uh, I checked, it's only the 199th anniversary of Marx's birth. You know, he didn't time either the publication of the of Capital or the Russian Revolution to make it a nice symmetrical set of anniversaries in, in one year. Uh, it's fitting, though, of course it would be fitting even if this wasn't a, you know, a, a year that has some symbolic resonance, but given that it, we like to uh, fetishize such anniversaries, it's a fitting time to reflect upon the problem of what's next, what's wrong with capitalism and what to do with it. That was, after all, the central driving force of Marx's own work, and at least the vision, if not the reality, of the attempt at transformation of the Russian Revolution as well. And we could hardly have a person who has been more committed to worrying about these issues as our opening visitor for this year's program than David Schweikart. Uh, <clears throat> He is currently a professor of philosophy at Loyola University. I didn't realize until we got his, uh, dis the description, the, bi the short bio that we ask of people, that he has a PhD in mathematics as well as philosophy. He's the author of Capitalism or Workers' Control and Ethical and Economic Appraisal in 1980, Against Capitalism, 1993, and a book which has, I think, gotten quite a lot of attention among uh, people concerned about Socialism and Markets, mar uh, debate about market socialism, uh, published in 1998, and more recently after capitalism, which I guess now is in a second edition. Uh, these are among the most challenging questions there that one can ask if you're a critic of the world as it is. Not simply what's wrong with the world in which we live, but what alternatives might make it better? This is also, those of you who know my work, my preoccupation. They're really difficult questions. Anybody who thinks there's easy answers to these issues just hasn't thought deeply enough about them, in my judgment. They're very difficult questions. And they're difficult in ways that is op are often discouraging for people to really embrace the problems that, because they're really hard to come up with knock-down, unassailable answers. Uh, David is one of the people who has thought deeply about these issues and continues to do so. And so it's really a great uh, special privilege and honor for us to have him here with us this week and to begin a year-long discussion of these things at the Hammond Center. David. Thank you all for the honor of being here. This is such a gorgeous place and it's such a wonderful university. Uh, so, I've got a lot to say. Let me just start with a quote. Uh, yeah, let's see if we can do all this properly. There we go. By a Nobel laureate in economics. The big challenges that capitalism now faces in the contemporary world include issues of inequality, especially that of grinding poverty in a world of unprecedented prosperity, and of public goods, that is, goods people share together like the environment. The solution to these problems will almost certainly call for institutions that take us beyond the capitalist market economy. That was a Marcia Sen back in 1999. That's the first time I've ever seen or a Nobel laureate saying we're going to have to get beyond capitalism. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the background. I mean, basically that's what this lecture series is going to be about. Today is mainly critique and then next tomorrow it's going to be what to do about it but some background about this project because this project is something I've been engaged in for my entire academic life you know as a philosopher uh, as Eric said I didn't start out as a philosopher I actually started out I, as an undergraduate back in what I now think of as stem one this was the early 60s we were, Sputnik had been launched, we were in an arms race and a space race with the Russians, so any patriotic young man going to college, it was just mostly men, uh, 
you should go into science or math or engineering. Okay, so, you know, that's what I did. You know, I started out as a mechanical engineer, found out very early that I really wasn't good at mechanical drawing. Uh, so I switched over and was doing physics and math and then finally settled on mathematics uh, as my major. And then it became time to go off to graduate school. Uh, so I went off to university has been much in the news of late, you know, University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. uh, and I spent five years there working on my PhD, but it was also at this point in time that I first got politicized. I did something political. Uh, and that was actually civil rights, okay. I was there in 64. Uh, I wound up going and spending a summer of uh, 1965 in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, just completely, you know, changed my life in a way, and I was sort of engaged in that, you know, ever since, and certainly during that period of time. Uh, and uh, it was also at this time that I heard people talking about the war in Vietnam in a negative way. Because I had grown up in a very conservative Catholic family. I was militant anti-communist or out to take over the world and so on. They're all atheists. I like to say, I never heard the word communism used without the adjective atheistic or godless, okay. Uh, but Vietnam was happening. If any of you are watching the Ken Burns series, uh, you know, this is much on my mind because I feel like I've stepped into a time machine and gone back to that period of time. Uh, but, uh, so I went off, got my PhD, went off to teach at the University of Kentucky. And there things really changed. Uh, and in fact, if you watch Ken Burns tonight, you'll see the event. Uh, 1969, I showed up there. Uh, spring of 1970, Kent State. Uh, there had been a little bit of political activity at University of Kentucky. There had been no, no anti-war activity at Virginia that I knew of. You know, I would, I would have known of it, it was going on. Uh, but Kent State happened, the campus exploded. The ROTC building on the campus was burned to the ground. Uh, by, I later found out, a young woman student that I knew. Uh, next thing I know, I'm sitting on the lawn in Lexington on the campus, here come the National Guard, you know, with their weapons and everything. Someone had passed out bags of marshmallows, so that when the guard got close, we were going to throw the marshmallows, you know, at the guard. Uh, of course, they didn't get that close before they started tear gassing us, and you know, we ran away. Uh, and it was that night, you know, that I really had a crisis of conscience. It was like I was also reading Thoreau at the time. I still remember the, the passage, the masses of men live lives of quiet desperation. It's like, oh my God, you know. Uh, because all I'm doing, I'm teaching math mostly to engineers, most of whom are going to go work for the military industrial complex. You know, is that what I want to do with my life? Uh, so I decided to try something else. And I had been a philosophy minor as an undergraduate. It was actually at the University of Dayton. It was all Thomistic philosophy. It was Thomas Aquinas and so on. But there was something about philosophy, asking about the meaningful life, the meaning of life, and these big questions. And I love teaching. So maybe I can get into a philosophy department. So I applied to Ohio State, which is actually where I grew up, Columbus. Mm. Uh, and got accepted. It was actually easy to get accepted because I had a PhD in math, and this is at a time when philosophy was really trying to become analytic, logical, scientific. Um, so, you know, that was fun, and I could also teach part-time in the math department, so it didn't cost the philosophy department anything in terms of scholarship. So, uh, so I had, you know, my second career beginning. But crucial event happened uh, in that summer between leaving math and starting philosophy. I moved to Columbus and I decided I should read some Marx. This Marx was being talked about. I'd never taken a course in Marx. There weren't any courses in Marx being offered back in those days. Uh, but, you know, I got a copy of Das Kapital, uh, the 150th anniversary. Uh, it wasn't then. Uh, and I read that book like a mathematician. You know, I spent two months reading it. I worked through every footnote. 
Uh, I worked through every equation. I took notes. I outlined it. And it turned my world upside down. I've never gotten over it. Uh, because at that time, you know, I was, had gotten political. I was against the war, I was civil rights, but it never occurred to me that there was something wrong with capitalism. I mean, capitalism was about freedom, and communism was about totalitarianism, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I expected when I was reading Marx, I could find this atheistic, militant, totalitarian, and that's just not what it was like. You know, it was like, wow, there are so many things here I've never thought about. Uh, and I came away, you know, really persuaded. I mean, not only things I never thought about, where did capitalism come from? How did you wind up, you know, with this system? And what were the conditions of workers at the time, you know, that Marx was writing? But the theoretical core. I mean, I became convinced that Marx is onto something, that there's a kind of exploitation going on that's invisible, you know, under capitalism. The exploitation under slavery or under serfdom was obvious. Something's going on here. Uh, and, you know, it was the moral critique, you know, that really got to me, but the problem was, well, what's the alternative, okay? And Marx doesn't give you an alternative. In fact, in one of the prefaces to, the, to Capital, he sort of talks about, no, I'm not offering recipes for cook shops of the future, okay? Uh, now, I couldn't fault Marx for that because he is trying to be rigorous. He's trying to be scientific. There was no data out there about alternatives. There were a few Proudhonian communes or something like that. But, you know. but what Marx did have, yeah, even though he's trying to be scientific, there's what I often think of as the Marxian hope, which he gets from Hegel, I think. He was, he was a philosopher. He got his PhD in philosophy. Hegel was the big influence here. And this idea that, that we are moving in a direction, humanity, and there are contradictions, but we will resolve those contradictions and ultimately, you know, we'll reach something you know, much better than what we have now. Uh, but what that would be like, Marx doesn't tell you, okay. But as I say, in 1975, when I, no, I'm sorry, 1970, when I'm reading this, you know, uh, no longer have that excuse. There are, you know, you had the Russian Revolution back in 1917, you have Eastern Europe, you have the Chinese Revolution, you have the Cuban Revolution. I mean, there is data out there, you know, what is the alternative? And the Soviet Union being the big model, it's like, mm, that doesn't look so attractive. Uh, granted, they were impressive for a while. In fact, when I was an undergraduate, I took the one economics class I ever took. I still remember Paul Samuelson's text showing this is the rate of growth of the United States. This is the rate of growth of the Soviet Union. And if present conditions continue, they will surpass us, you know, by the year 2000. You know. Well, they weren't, you know. By the time I didn't say it, it's the Soviet, it's slackened off, you know. And there was a lot of, you know, things since that there's something wrong with this economic model. And there were some experiments going on. Uh, experiments with using markets in socialism. Hungary was talking about goulash socialism. We're going to have some markets here. Yugoslavia had broken away from the Soviet Union. They were introducing markets, competitive markets, and also the idea of workers owning the factories, working workers controlling the factories. So it was like there was a lot of ferment going on right at this period of time when I happened to be, you know, in this situation. And economists were getting interested in that. So there were a lot of economists working out models and you know doing figuring out the data but also the theoretical foundations and all of this. And having that math background was just perfect because, you know, I could uh, <laughs> read The Economist, and not be intimidated by all the mathematical equations and all that kind of stuff. So that really became my project. Uh, for my dissertation, you know, I wrote Capitalism, a Utilitarian Analysis. Utilitarian, there's got to be an ethical framework. That's what I loved about philosophy. You can talk about ethics, you can talk about values and so on. That counts, okay? And so I have, but, if, but the thing is, if you're doing a utilitarian analysis, utilitarian and what promotes the greatest happiness for the greatest number, it's not enough just to have a critique. You gotta show there's something better, okay? Uh, so 
And as I say, there were a lot of economists and so on working on this topic at the time, and so that really became, you know, my dissertation. It became um, uh, the book that got me published. I mean, got me tenure at Loyola. Uh, and in a sense, I've been writing the same book, you know, over and over. Uh, the world keeps changing. The Soviet <laughs> Union collapses, and all, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the idea is that. I was thinking about back then, and I wasn't just me thinking about them, but I feel like that really held up kind of remarkably well and surprising. And the issues now seem to be so much more pressing than they did back when I was doing that. At the time I was doing this, you know, the, the U.S. economy, the U.S. looked pretty good. I mean, first of all, we had the civil rights problem, but Johnson had passed the, the Voting Rights Act, and we, Congress had passed that. And, the, and people were turning against the war, you know, unions were strong, wages were going up, and so on and so forth, you know. Uh, it's not the way it looks right now. Uh, in fact, it's really clear that I think, you know, that we got fundamental structural problems, which I'll get to in a minute. But first, uh, how is capitalism, first of all, what is capitalism? So we should start with that. Uh, what is capitalism? What is a capitalist? Well, my definition of capitalism is three factors. You've got private ownership of the means of production. Okay. You've got a market. You've got this competitive market, this invisible hand that does a lot of the economic pricing and allocation and so on. And you've got wage labor, which is something I really hadn't thought about, you know, before reading Marx, but the fact that for the vast majority of people, you don't have any immediate access to a job, means of production. You've got to find someone that will hire you. That wasn't the way it was in other forms of civilization. You know, this is some advance. We're free now, but, you know, there's something about that that we're going to look at more carefully. And then what is a capitalist? Okay, this is my definition, but it's someone that owns enough productive assets that she can, if she so does, chooses, live comfortably on the income generated from your assets. Uh, what would that be? Well, you know, again, a back of the envelope calculation. If you have $2 million in stocks and bonds, productive assets, okay, get a 5% return on that, you'll be making $100,000 a year just from your assets. You don't have to work, you know. If you've got that much wealth, then I count you as a capitalist, okay. Most capitalists do work, you know, but, you know, you don't have to, you know. Uh, and that turns out to be really the upper 1%. You know, the numbers are come out pretty much that way. Uh, so the capitalist class, you know, um, is really the, my view, the upper 1%. That's what I'm mainly talking about. There's other ways of defining it, but, you know. It is interesting that the notion of capitalist is different from saying socialist or communist. When you say you're a socialist, that means you believe in socialism, okay? But you're a capitalist, that has nothing to do with what you believe in. That's not the point. The point is, you know, what is your, you know, what's the structure in the, of the society? Are you getting income coming in on a regular basis, you know, by your simple ownership of productive assets? Okay. So the question is, the question first is, how do you ethically justify this? And the way my project was set out is, first, what are the non-comparative justifications? Just what ethical problems might there be with a system, you know, ethically? And there's a number uh, that I treat in the first part of my book, and I've been thinking about this a long time. Neo, I call it neoclassical shenanigans, you know. Marginal product of, uh, uh, as contribution. Now, uh, there's a historical background to this is very important. Because remember, when capitalism came onto the scene and started to develop, it was like, what is going on here? You know, kind of Adam Smith, how, there's nobody in control. The invisible hand is in control. How is that working, you know? Nobody's controlling, and yet it's not chaos, you know? So try to figure out, what is this new system? How does it work? You know, this is where you start trying mathematical modeling, you know, and one of the first to do this was David Ricardo. Smith alludes to the labor theory of value. The question is, you're trading things on a market, you know, okay, nobody's setting the prices. What determines prices? 
and the labor theory of value, you make enough simplifying assumptions, but as a mathematician making simplifying assumptions, that's what you do, you know, to try to get a sense of the basic structure of something. It's the amount of labor embodied in the commodities, okay? That's what's driving everything. But this raises an ethical issue, political issue that Ricardo is sensitive to. It's like, well, what about all these landowners out there? Those landlords, you know? Why are they getting anything? They're not contributing any labor. They happen to own this land, and they can collect rent and so on. Marx takes it a step further. It's not only the landowners that are parasites, if you want. The capitalist also, you know, is high, isn't engaged in labor either, you know. Uh, and this idea that Labor is a source of value, not the capital, because capital, what is these machinery? Well, workers are making the machines and everything, and so on and so forth. Uh, requires a rethinking of the discipline of economics, which is just becoming you know, a discipline at the time. It was called political economy. It then changes its name to economics, so it could be a real science. Forget about politics. Uh, but you had the marginalist revolution. Uh, and the early one of the early uh, proponents of this was quite aware of the politics, you know. It was John Bates Clark, you know, the latter part of the 19th century. If labor is the source of all, if the labor theory of value is right, then workers are going to become revolutionists, and every, all of them have a right to be that way, okay. We need a new theory, okay. Uh, and the new theory is the marginalist theory. And uh, here... Oh, I'm sorry, these are the other ones I'm going to come up against, up to, then I'll, you know. Capitalism's white knight, the risk of reward, we'll, we'll talk about those as we go along. Okay, the basic argument of the neoclassical, this new model of economics, which is still the main model that you're going to learn in, in undergraduate economics classes, uh, interest is the contribution of capital. Now, it so happens that a mathematical theorem enters in here, which... I think I would argue is the most significant mathematical theorem historically ever, okay? Euler's theorem. A theorem that I learned as a mathematician and learned how to prove it and so on. I didn't know it had anything to do with politics, okay? But here it is. You got a function of a certain, that has a certain characteristic. If P of AX, AY, AZ, in other words, if each of X, Y, and Z are increased by percent A, then the total function increases that much, okay? Then something follows, okay, what does that mean? Well, when economists pick up on this, they say, okay, we're talking about a production function. X, Y, and Z, land, labor, and capital. There are three things that enter into production, okay? Uh, say X is the amount of land, Y is the amount of workers, the number of workers, C is the amount of capital, okay? And this, first condition, if you expand each of those by the same amount, does production, production increase will also by that amount. It's basically constant returns to scale. You know, if you increase your labor force, your land, and your workforce by 10%, you'll get 10% as much outcome. Now, of course, lots of simplifying assumptions, but, you know, that's the way economists work, and that's something you need, do need to do. Okay. But then Euler's theorem says, if that's the way the function is, and if it's got a couple of other simple factor. This total, the total product of X, Y, and Z breaks into three parts. X, the number of acres of land times the marginal productivity of land. What does marginal productivity mean? It means if you kept all the other factors constant, it's a partial derivative for the mathematicians in here, you know, and expand land by a little bit, how much, you know, will the output expand? Okay. So you get, you know, the number of acres of land times the marginal productivity of land. You get the marginal product of labor times the number of laborers plus the marginal product of capital plus the amount of capital, okay? It splits into three parts, okay? And not only that, you can show that our conditions of perfect competition, the market will set the wage rate at the marginal productivity of labor. The marginal will set the rent at the marginal productivity of land. Capital interest will be set at the marginal productivity of capital. Okay, 
It's like, oh my God, you know, this big pile of corn I've got here, we can say how much of it was contributed by the labor, how much of it was contributed by the land, how much of it was con contributed by capital, and then what each of them gets is precisely what they contributed. Wages will be set, you know, at the marginal productivity of labor, rent will be set at the marginal productivity of land, you know, and capital. So there's no exploitation, it's fair. But of course, there's a problem with this theory. The word contribution, that's an ethical term. You know, you're saying the land contributed, the workers contributed, therefore, presumably, you're, you, you know, that's yours, you're do that back for your contribution. But the Euler's theorem is not about ethics. It's just saying you can divide it up this way with this theorem, okay. But there's a problem. First of all, you think about it, well, the laborer gets a wage. It's the marginal productivity of the last laborer. So you got all these laborers. It's how much contribution did the last one? How did that change? That's times the number of workers. That's how much the labor contributed. You know. The land and capital, it's like, well, yes, the land, the rent, but the rent doesn't go to the land. The rent goes to the land owner. The capital, the interest doesn't go to the capital. It goes to the capitalist, okay, the provider of capital. The provider of land, the provider of capital really aren't doing anything. They're just letting their thing be used, their asset be used, okay. So, you know, it's really not. It's meant to be an argument to show that the system is just. It really doesn't show that. Okay. Well, and, and again, capital is completely passive, which leads to the next justification. Wait a minute. Capitalists aren't passive. Capitalists are out there. They're coming up with new ideas. They're, you know, creating new technologies. We're in the most revolutionary period ever, as Marx himself said in the Communist Manifesto. Uh, so, you know... That's not fair about the capitalists, okay? Oh, granting permission is not a productive contribution. Okay, the entrepreneur, okay? But here it's interesting, when you actually read this, the early neoclassical stuff, the entrepreneur isn't the capitalist. The entrepreneur is the one that hires the labor, rents the land, borrows the money from the capitalists, and creates things, okay? Now, entre entrepreneurs are doing things, okay? They are making a contribution, okay. But, and you're gonna need, I will argue, entrepreneurs in any society, you know, that you wanna have as a dynamic society. That's not the same as a capitalist, okay. Uh, the capitalist is the one that supplies the capital, not the one that actually creates something, comes up with a new product, new ideas, and so on. If you think of Shark Tank, you get the example. You got these entrepreneurs, they got these ideas and so on, but you gotta convince the people with the money to fund you, okay? But funding you doesn't mean you're creating it, okay? You're simply making it possible. And you expect a return on this. Okay. Uh, function of capitalist is to provide the capital. Entrepreneurs will be needed under socialism, I would argue, and we'll talk about that you know, next time, how that's gonna work. So there's another argument. And these are they're kind of technical arguments. Risk and reward, you know, playing reverse lotto. You know, I deserve a return because I've risked my capital. Okay. And it's a fair game. And if we can think of this by looking at, first of all, the notion of pure procedural justice, which is an idea that philosophers talk about. You know, John Rawls made this big central idea in his own theory of justice. A procedure is fair. If the procedure is fair, then whatever the outcome is, it's fair, okay? Like playing a game of poker with your friends, okay? I mean, as long as nobody's cheating, okay, everyone knows what the, how the game is played, okay? Yeah, the outcome's not gonna be equal, okay? But it's fair, okay? Well, isn't the investment game like that? The investment game is kind of like playing poker. Some people win, some people lose. Okay, what's the problem here? Well, here you invoke a couple of game theory concepts. Zero-sum games, negative-sum games, positive-sum games. So, what's that all about? Well, zero-sum game just means 
you add up the gains and you add up the losses, they cancel out. If you're playing poker with your friends, you know, however much people won, other people have lost exactly that amount. Okay, negative sum games, less is paid out than is taken in. That's why it's irrational to go to Las Vegas, right? You know, or buy a lot of lottery ticket because Clearly, the game is set, set up in such a way that less is going to be paid out than is going to be taken in. So your expectations are negative. You know, you're foolish to buy a lottery ticket or go to Las Vegas unless you just want the, the thrill and excitement. But rationally, it doesn't make sense. But then there are positive sum games. And my argument is the investment game, the capital, is a positive sum game. More is, granted, some people lose, but more people win. More money is won, and if you just look at the numbers, you know how much is interest income comes in, how income just from profit, you know, stock dividends, net stock dividends, and so on. It's trillions of dollars. Okay, it's a positive sum game, but it's a game. It's open to anyone, but you can't play if you don't have money. Okay, so if you don't have money, you can't play this game. And not only that, the more money you have, the more you're likely to win. Not only just from the math of it, but you also you could you know, position to hire experts and so on and so forth. You got enough money, you can give it to a hedge fund, and let them you know use you know, all the sophisticated algorithms and so on and make you huge amounts of money. So uh, the argument is it's not a fair game. Counter argument: not everyone can play. Capitalist investment game is a positive sum game. Okay, one final one. Utility and disutility of deferred consumption. Okay. This was the argument that, well, if everyone's just consuming what they get, there won't be any money available for investment. When you save your money, you put it in a bank, it can be loaned out to people that need it, to these entrepreneurs and so on and so forth. You know, you deserve this. Okay. The basic story is, Standard story, you have savings, that leads to investment, that leads to growth. Okay, makes everybody better off. Then comes the Keynesian bombshell. Okay, Keynes says, no, that's not the way it works. Okay, the story really is, you start with investment and that generates growth, and out of growth comes savings. And not only that, Savings can be counterproductive. Now, how does that work? You don't need savings for investment. Well, Keynes says no, and he uses this example of the Great, during the Great Depression. No, if you got idle resources there, you got people there, you know, that are out of jobs. Put them to work. Where are you going to get the money? Print the money. You know, governments can print money. Put people to work. When they when they put people to work, they have you know, money, then they can start saving, okay. But you don't need savings to generate investment, you know. And in fact, savings can be counterproductive because if you're saving, that means you're not spending the money. And under capitalism, and this is something Marx talks about in the Communist Manifesto, you get these bizarre kind of crises, you know, overproduction crises. People are producing more. They don't, it's not that, they don't need the stuff that's being produced. They don't have the money to buy it. But if you're just saving your money, you're not spending it. So who's going to buy the goods? Well, if not enough people are buying the goods, those people get laid off. The workers get laid off, and they don't have money to buy the goods. You get, you know, this kind of problem here. So, and, and the important thing here also to remember is, okay, you don't need savings for growth, so you don't need to pay people interest to encourage them to save. In modern capitalist economy, savings can be detrimental to growth. That's what I just said. And this is important. Uh, investing. We use this language, investing. I invested in the stock market. I invested. In fact, that's not investing in the Keynesian sense. Investing in the real sense means investing in the real economy. That means paying people to go to work, to build a factory, to build machines, to do something like that. Investing in the stock market is just savings. Because when you buy shares of stock, the money doesn't go to the company that you're buying them from. It goes to somebody else. Okay, you're basically saving. You buy a bond, you know, you're saving. Okay, uh, 
So now only on those rare occasions when there's an IPO, an initial public offering, then yeah, the money you pay does go to the company, but most of the time you're just savings. And that, by the way, is an extremely important issue. Right now, contemporary, you may have noticed that since the crash of 2008, the stock market, well, the stock market in 2008 was 14,000, it dropped to seven, now it's up to 2,100. What is going on? Is it because the economy is just growing and everybody's you know, so much better off? Well, no. When, in, when people that have money don't see a good outlet for investing in the real economy, you buy stock, you buy shares. That makes the price go up. So you've really got a problem here of savings and when the stock market is going up, you've got the problem, well, you know, let's borrow money so we can invest in the stock market and make more. Uh, that's built into the system, but, but buying shares of stock and so on is not saving. I mean, it's savings, it's not investing. You shouldn't use that you know, language. Okay, then the third, there is no alternative. That's the third argument, not in the sense there's no alternative to capitalism, but there's nothing that's better than that. So you can accept the fact that in investing in financial markets isn't really a productive activity. Most capitalists aren't entrepreneurs. You know, the investment game favors those with more money to risk in the financial markets. Private savings are not necessary for economic to economy to grow. Savings can be harmful to the economy. But still, Tina, any attempt to fundamentally alter <laughs> the basic institutions of capitalism as opposed to softening their rough edges, will kill the goose that's laying the golden eggs. So, there's this comparative argument, okay? Granted, you can have these ethical problems and qualms about people making money, you know, but if there's no better alternative to that, you know, then that's what we're gonna go with. Uh, so, this leads to you know, part two, and I'll try to be Although it's the more serious part of the way, these are the non-comparative arguments. What's wrong with capitalism, you know, uh, straight out? And I've got what I call my seven count indictment of capitalism. Uh, inequality, unemployment, a little too much leisure, actually overwork is what I really wanted to say there. Poverty in the midst of plenty, economic instability, environmental degradation, and democracy in chains. And these are the, the really serious ones. The other ones are like, well, morally, maybe you shouldn't have this, but these are the real problems. And inequality <laughs> is an interesting one. I mean, everybody knows now there's a lot of inequality and so on. Vastly more than when I was started this project back in the 1970s. You know, we were vastly more egalitarian society back then. But it's still, I mean, you see the data, like the top six, the richest six people in the world own more wealth than the bottom 50% of humanity, you know, this kind of stuff. But it's really kind of hard to wrap your head around this. And one way that I've found I, that's useful for doing this is, it's a, I call it a parade of dwarves and a few giants. And this is the way it works, okay. There's 120 million households in the United States. States, roughly. Okay. Suppose we get a representative from each one of these. Okay. Line them all up. The poorest first on them. Okay. We're going to have a parade. The parade is going to last an hour. And you do a little hocus pocus so that heights adjust to income, household income. Okay. So if you're poor, you're little. If you're rich, you're bigger. Okay. You are of average height. And let's say average height is six foot, just to keep the math simpler, you know. Uh, average height today, average income, average household income now is about $70,000. So you're <coughs> of average height and you're watching this parade, you know, what are you going to see? Well, not surprisingly, you're gonna see a lot of little people, you know, for a while. In fact, for 20 minutes, a third of the parade goes by, people, are up to the $35,000 mark. You know, a third of the population mm -hmm. is less than that. Half the parade goes by. You know, your average height, you're kind of expecting to see someone your height, but they're only four and a half feet tall. Okay, what's going on here?
profile, and you may know there's a difference between median and average. Okay. Median means half make less, half make more. Average takes the total, total amount divided by number of households. So uh, the average, the median income, half the families in the United States, half the households make less than 50000 a year. Okay. Um, in fact, it's not until two-thirds of the parade has gone by that you're actually up now to average. You know. Two-thirds of the parade have gone by, you're up to 70000 average income. And it goes up to that. If you, if you make it to the 20%, if you're making you know, $100,000, 48 minutes, you're in the upper 20%. Of the households, okay. Um, you're, you're nine foot tall at that point. You go up to 12 feet tall during the last 10 percent. Six minutes left, you know, in the parade, you know, you're making 140 thousand dollars, okay. Um, the last, the five percent, okay. Now you're up to 180 thousand, okay. Uh, 16 feet tall, okay. So you're you know, getting up there. But still, it's really, it's interesting if you look at the graph, it's really kind of a slow increase. You know, it starts to go up a little bit toward the end, but, you know, it's, then things start to change. Okay, that's the upper 5%, the upper 1%. Upper 1% means there's 36 seconds left to go in the, in the parade. Okay. Now, all of a sudden, you're making 400000 $400,000 happens to be the highest paid government official in the United States. $400,000 is what the president is given. Okay. $400,000 is what the Chief Justice and Supreme Court is given. Okay. The borderline of the 1%. And in terms of height, that puts you at about 35 feet tall. I often think, I live in Hyde Park in Chicago, and there's a lot of these three-floor three walk-ups. You know, walking around Hyde Park, it's like, it's like, gee, there's some really little people there, and then there's some bigger people, there's people my size, and then there's these people that are as big as the three-story apartment, you know, wow. That's nothing compared to what's about to come, okay? Because if you move from the 1% from the to the 0.1%, 3.6 seconds left now, now you're up to $1,600,000. You've increased four in those couple of seconds. You've gone up four times. Okay. Uh, uh, 0.01, less than one second to go. You know, a third of a second to go. Now you're up to 800 feet. You're basically an 80-story, you know, building, uh, making nine million dollars a year income. Then in the last four microseconds, <laughs> things really get interesting. Okay. There's about, well, there's, according to Forbes, there's 500 and some billionaires in the United States today. You know, if you're a billionaire, you're making uh, a 6% uh, on return on your income, on your wealth, you know, which you know, normally you're going to make more than that because you give it to a hedge fund or something. That puts you a mile above the earth. Okay. Then the last few. Now in 2009 when I was doing this calculation, the highest income on record that year was David Tepper. Who? <coughs> no one ever heard of David Tepper? At a hedge fund, you know, Appaloosa Plump Fund. That year he made, and this is the year after the crisis, he made Four billion dollars that year. Okay, as did you know presumably the Koch brothers. The Koch brothers, you probably have heard of the Koch brothers. Uh, they have a combined wealth of eighty billion. So if they're getting five percent, they're getting four billion a year. Okay, how tall is that? Well, that puts you. First of all, four billion. That is ten thousand times more than the president of the United States makes. 10,000 times more. It puts you 64 miles above the Earth. <laughs> Mount Everest is 12 miles tall. So you're more than five times taller than Mount Everest. Okay. Uh, 
That's what the distribution of income in the United States looks like now. And as you may know, you know, wealth is much more unequal than income. So I won't even try to graph that. You know, just be a flat line, and, you know, to this forever. But you know, that's inequality. That's going to be a problem. We're going to think about why that's a problem. But a lot, there's been a lot of studies. The more more unequal society is, the more crime, the more you know, uh, lots of social problems, you know, lots of anxiety, all of this kind of stuff. Uh, we'll come back to that another time. But the inequality is just mind-boggling. And of course, the thing about under cap, the inequality will just explode. It keeps getting better because you can make money with money. When you've got four billion extra dollars a year to invest, you know, and make your six percent or more return on that, it you get you know this spiraling exponential <coughs> growth. Thomas Piketty's made a big deal about that, you know, in his book. But the math is even more basic than that. I mean, even if it we're all distributed the same rate, if we we're all growing at the same rate, which we're not, but if we were, still the gap grows at the same rate too. I mean, doubling a million dollars and doubling your 50,000, well, you know, the gap is more, almost doubled, okay? So you got this dynamic of being able to make money with money, you know, just that's the way it's going to work, okay? Unless you have really radical, you know, redistribution. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, there they are. Coke Brothers and Dave Tepper. Okay, those... Go through a couple more of these. Uh, oh, that was out, that's out of place. We'll get back to that one. Uh, so, now, I'll hit a couple of these. These will be quicker. Unemployment. Capitalism requires unemployment. It used to be when we were taking economics courses. No, the, when the market is working, there's full employment. Nobody talks about that anymore because it actually was Milton Friedman that introduced the notion of the natural rate of unemployment. Uh, it gets refined to the non-accelerating rate of unemployment. In other words, the non-accelerating non inflation rate of unemployment. The argument here is, if unemployment gets too low, well, then workers are going to want, you know, more money, you know, and they don't have to worry about, you know, losing their jobs and so on and so forth. So the companies will give them that. Then they'll raise prices. And then workers will look around and say, hey, the prices are going to, we want more money. And you get, you know, this inflationary spiral. Another way of putting it is something that a great economist, Michael Kolesky, argued, unemployment is the disciplinary stick to keep workers in line. Because if you think about it, in a capitalist enterprise, you've got conflicting interest. You know, from a capitalist point of view, labor is a cost of production. You want to keep that labor down, those costs down as much as you can. Okay, and get as much work out of your workforce as possible. On the other hand, if you're a worker, it's like, I don't have any stake in this company, you know, I'd rather work, do as little work as possible, get paid as much as possible. Well, how do you get your workers to stay in line and work hard? You can't, like the good old days of slavery, where you can whip them and so on, make them work, you know. No, you gotta be able to fire them. Okay, and it leads to this other issue, of Poverty in the midst of plenty, firing somebody's got to be painful. You know, if it's comfortable, you know, not working, you know, then the discipline is going to break down, okay? And I'm often struck because when I was first encountering this back in the you know, 70s when I was working on this topic, President Johnson had declared war on poverty. We're the richest country in the world. We've got poverty. Let's eliminate poverty. He even invited you know, Michael Harrington, a socialist, to the White House to talk about this, you know. When's the last time you've heard anybody talk about eliminating poverty? I mean, we're vastly richer than we were back then, okay. But nobody even pretends we're going to eliminate poverty. Um, the economic instability, that's the other one, that's the one we've just come through. But, but here you've got this mechanism for capitalism to be stable, you know, your investors have to be kept happy because if investors don't invest, well then, you know, there's got to be not enough income in the economy to buy the things that have been produced so people start getting laid off. So investors have to invest in the real economy, not the stock market, you know. Then 
those investments have to pay off because if they're not, if you're not getting the innovation and the productivity gains, then you're not going to invest, okay. Then people have to have enough money to buy this stuff. They've got to want to buy this stuff. This is why we have to put billions of dollars into the advertising industry to persuade people you've got to buy this stuff because if you're not buying this stuff, that's not what the ads say, but if you're not, if people stop buying, well then it's not like you're going to just stabilize. You're going to get a recession, okay? So all of those things have to be working. And when they're, if, and above all, when investors lose confidence, it's not just them that suffer. I mean, everybody does. You start getting unemployment. You start getting a recession. You start, you know, there's something destructive and crazy about you know, having these kind of economic crisis when it has nothing to do. Economic crisis in earlier periods, it was shortages. You had a war, you had a plague, you had a plague of locusts, you had something like that that cut, cut down the... Now it's crisis because people don't know how many buy all the stuff we've produced. Okay, Which leads you to the environmental degradation, which really... Uh, my earlier versions, you know, mentioned this, had that as one. Now, if I'm doing a revision, it's going to be at the top. You know, this whole issue of, above all, climate change, but the massive environmental degradation is going. Why? Because a capitalist economy to remain healthy has to keep growing. Okay. If you're not growing, you're going to stagnate. You're going to fall into recession. Everybody's, you know, going to be worse off. And yet, if you do the math, it doesn't make sense. So for example, in the 20th century, okay, the average rate of growth in the 20th century was 3% a year. Now, that's not a super big rate of growth. If you do the math, a 3% rate of growth means you double every 24 years, which means 24 you doubled, then four by mid-century, then eight times, by the end of the year, the century, you're going to be consuming 16 times more stuff. You know, just to have a healthy, quote, rate of growth. Uh, that's why, you know, oops, I oh, went backwards, sorry. Do I have my, no, never mind. I had my, the, the quote from my, one of my favorite economists, uh, only a madman or an economist thinks you can have infinite, infinite growth forever in a finite world. Okay, you can't. Uh, uh, so, I mean, theoretically you can, but to imagine that that's you know, going to happen is just crazy. Let's see, maybe go down one more. Uh, oh, never mind. Uh, the one last thing is the degradation of democracy. I call it Democracy in Chains, inspired by a new book that's out. You may have heard. If you haven't, you should look at it. It's an extraordinary book. It's Terrifying. It's called Democracy and Change, The Deep History of the Radical Rights Stealth Plan for America by Nancy McLean. She's a, uh, a named professor of history at Duke University. And realizing what, it's so interesting because I teach philosophy. I was just teaching Plato's Republic, okay. And for any of you that remember the Republic, you know, you have at the end this typology of alternative forms of government. You know, you have start with the ideal state, then it degenerates into a military rule, then to oligarchy, and then to democracy, and then finally to tyranny. And making the transition from oligarchy to democracy, it's like the ordinary people look around and the rich are getting richer and richer back in Plato's time in an oligarchy. And people look around and say, what's going on here? There's a lot more of us than there are of them, okay? And so they revolt. Okay. The threat is always there when you have more and more inequality that the wealthy are going to get more and more nervous about you know, the situation. Okay. And, you know, and it's interesting how widespread it's becoming now. I mean, you know, I taught Republic just last week, broke my students into little groups, right? Uh, and they don't know my politics, they haven't gotten to that yet, they will later on. Uh, and, which form of government do we have in the United States? Oligarchy or democracy? My class of 35, 25 said oligarchy. Five said democracy, five, you know, were undecided. 
I mean, it's really becoming astonishing. Uh, and and the, the, the degree to which the money has is taken over, and that's part of this book showing how this is working. You know, when you've got, well, if you think about the Koch brothers, you got four billion dollars. I mean, you know, that means you could give, you know, a million dollars to four thousand, you know, candidates or something. You can set up all of these institutes. You can do all of these, which is going down, going on. You can do the big data to see if you capture an election the year that the redistricting is going on, how you should draw the borders of these districts to make sure, you know, that, you know, the good guys come out on top, even though they're definitely not the majority. So, anyway, that's where we stand today, and I will now take any questions you have. I'll tell you next, don't ask me what the, what the solution is, because that's next time, you gotta come next time. <laughs> <laughs> yes? If I'm a, a small time operator and I'm going to have a business, I'm going to hire somebody to dig holes. And this is way back when. So he's digging holes with his hands. And we get about one hole a day. Okay? Then I find a shovel. Or I find out about a shovel. I say, okay, well, I'm going to borrow some money and buy a shovel, put it in his hands. Now we get eight holes a day. He's not working any more hours. He's not working any harder. So labor isn't doing anything more to earn any more of the proceeds from this. It's a result of my capital being responsible for that and my initiative. Yeah. And but so that it seems that capital really does, in a sense, deserve part of this. Okay, and the argument there is, no, your initiative does, that's the entrepreneurial, you know, ability that you had to see this could be done, and the shovel, the capital didn't make the shovel, workers made the shovel, okay? okay. Now, I mean, it is true, if there was no alternative, no other way of getting these things financed except from private savings, you know, your private savings, but when you do that, you're opening the door to this massive accumulation. It's one thing, yeah, small businessmen, it's hard. first of all, you're working, you're not a capitalist. I mean, you, you might have some cap, some means of production and so on. Well, but your infusion, the, the infusion of the money to buy a, a shovel. Yeah. You know. But the money didn't create the shovel, that's the point. Workers created the shovel, okay. And if there was But they got paid to make that shovel. Well, yeah, but they didn't get paid as much as the shovel's going to be sold for, you know, and that's another issue that we're going to talk more about the next time. But it's true, I mean, you know, I mean, Marx himself, capitalism provides an incentive for technologically revolutionizing the means of production and so on and so forth. And if that were the only thing you could do, because you need that, you know, mm -hmm. you need the entrepreneurs, you need that initiative and so on. The question is, do you have to, is this the only way to get it? You know, by allowing money to make money, because then it does, you know, this compound interest kicks in, you know, the gap gets wider and wider. It's going to be that, you know, unless, and, and again, you, well, you could put drastic reforms to rein that in, but that's precisely where the wealthy know that you might try to do that. We've got to make sure that doesn't happen. You don't have that option. That's the problem. Yeah, I guess where I'm going is there seems to be a continuum, and I'm not I'm not questioning the the, the, the uber wealthy sort of business that's going on there. there. I think there needs to be changes there as well. But it's not simply oh, capital doesn't get any credit sort of thing. Um, just other one other small point. Uh, Everest is probably more like about seven miles high and not twelve. Oh, I thought it was twelve. I thought I looked it up. It would probably be about six over sixty thousand feet. Everest <laughs> is more like about 35. Okay, times. I'll have to double check on that. So it's even worse than that. It's even higher than five times bigger. It's, you know, Coke Yes? So I guess, is this going to reveal my, um, I actually know more about Marx's version of capitalism than the current version. But I have a feeling that Marx doesn't talk as much about capital in terms of investment capital as he does about the means of production. And I wondered, you're, the, the version of capitalism that you're describing is really a financialized capitalism of the late 20th century and early 21st century. Well, the financialization has certainly taken place, but Marx does talk about it in volume two. And so when you're talking about the sur you created this surplus, okay, but the surplus value, what distinguishes capitalism and other earlier forms, there was always surplus being created under feudalism. Yeah, your serfs, they 
did all the work, you know, they wrote all, but the, the feudal group, they, you just consume it, okay? The capitalists don't just consume it, you know, they invest part of it. And it's that investment that gives capitalism its dynamism, but it also, you know, means, you know, the capitalist class, those that have access to that are going to get richer and richer, and you're going to have this clash to keep the wages down because you want to keep your workers down, you want to grow as much as possible. Uh, I mean, so it comes out of that. Uh, I mean, the finance has just taken over. I mean, it's much worse now. I think it's, and partly it's invisible now. You don't know what those markets are doing, okay? And yet so much, trillions of dollars just flow around out there. Like, what is happening? And sort of everyone kind of knows that. Like, there's something crazy about these financial markets. But I have no idea how they work, okay? So it must be the government. We need to get a, you know, we need a new president or something like that. I mean, that's, and that's part of what capitalism's resiliency is. It's so complex. Feudalism is obvious. There's lords up there, and the, they're not doing anything, you know? We're doing all the work. Let's just overthrow them and divide up the land among ourselves. It's much more complicated, you know, under capitalism. And that's what does give it a resiliency, I think. But the surplus, you know, Marx definitely, that, that what distinguishes capitalism from these earlier forms is the fact that that surplus is not all consumed. You know, it's invested, you know, and that gives it its dynamism. I know very little about this, but so I'm sort of starting to think of this as there's, there's almost like two markets. There's, you know, the regular market where you invest in the real world in things that produce things, and then there's this other market that's the stock market. It's like the money, the market for money, where you put your money to make more money. Right, right. And it's disconnected from... No, they are. I mean, they're related in a sense, you know, they're, the they're stock market originally money. developed because, you know, then, because you, you wanted to have this, you know, originally you were gonna, sailing off and buying things, you know, you have to have, you know, you don't have the money yourself to do all of this. You can sell shares in your operation, and we come back. You make money, so it's enable people to pool their money for these projects and so on. Uh, and it meant, you know, you didn't have to risk everything. It wasn't all or nothing. You know, you can buy shares. So it actually did make investment easier. But the logic has just kept building and building and building until now. I mean, finance is just taking, and it's. I mean, I'm going to argue next time, Wall Street really isn't doing almost nothing of value anymore. Okay, there's a much more transparent, clear way of figuring out what needs to be done here. Um, but, yeah, it's a different world, those two markets, for sure. Because you need investment in the real economy. That definitely has to go on, you know. But do you really need all of these elaborate, you know, financial instruments, bonds? I mean, just, you know, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I, I think capitalism has evolved into political fear without the control of the government, the educational institutions, and the law. I don't think capitalism could support itself. I think we're pretty much living in some kind of fear. Would you comment on that? Well, I mean, I do think it's not sustainable. I mean, I think that is true, you know. Uh, that the underlying economic problems are going to get worse, and then you've got, above all, this ticking time bomb of climate change that the free market is not going to solve, and so on, and so we've got to keep thinking about something. There's a lot of distraction going on, so you don't have to think about those kinds of things. Uh, but, no, I mean, again, for Marx, there was a period of time when capitalism was generating massive, you know, innovations and so on. It did have a positive role to play, okay, but now we've gotten to the point where the negatives, this is Hegelian, the contradictions are there, but the, the negative parts of the contradiction get more and more and more acute. We've got to move to another stage. And it's becoming clearer what that next stage could be, where we can keep the strengths of capitalism, because capitalism clearly has strengths, you know, without all these negatives, you know, or at least much mitigated negatives. You know, I'll tell you how that's going to work next time. Yes. What about uh, interest rates? You know, you used to be, I think in the 1700s, uh, people would loan money for 4 or 5% or whatever. And now you put money in the bank and you get 0.1%. Well, yeah, that's part. That's because of quantitative easing. In order to save the banks, because they'd made all these crazy investments and bought all these, you know, 
mortgage-backed securities and other derivatives, you know, you, you got to, because you, you created these private banks which have to be kept healthy. It's like the investors generally. You've got to keep the investors happy. If they are unhappy, the whole economy is going to tank, okay? So, you know, one way of doing that was to keep, but the point of keeping interest was low was so that they'll make loans. But you're still, but the problem is, even though interest are so low, investors aren't investing that much. They are investing some, you know, but the point is for the low interest rates is to encourage investors to invest in the real economy. But the other thing you can do with low interest rates is borrow money and then invest in the stock market. Well, and then yeah. a lot of the large corporations are sitting on piles. Exactly. Of money. Because they don't see real investment opportunities out there. That is a problem, you know. And that's the Keynesian idea. You're saving. That is saving. And savings it can be detrimental, you know, to the economy. Although ultimately, we need an economy that doesn't have to keep growing. The problem with capitalism is got to keep. If you're not growing, you're going to be in recession. Okay, we need an economy that stabilizes, you know, that we can use our productivity for other things like having more leisure time and having a healthier life and all of these kinds of things. You're not going to get that, you know, under the existing system. Yeah. In your expertise, how long do you think the transition will take to uh, reform capitalism? Well, uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit next time, but of course the answer is I don't know. But what I do know, and then the clock, it's much more imminent now than it ever has been because the, and again, this is why this whole issue of environment and climate change, things that we used to think, well, maybe in my lifetime I'll, no, we can't wait, you know, 30, 40, 50 years hoping, no, it's going to have to come sooner, you know. I know it's terrifying, but so is the alternative. And, we're going to have to see, and it, that's why it's really important to have a sense of what you would need to do, what kind of institutions, because it's easy to be critical, but if you don't have something that you've got good evidence to think would work to put in its place, you know, well, you can just, after a while, I just don't want to think about it anymore, because it's too depressing, you know, but that's not going to solve the problem. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your thought process behind narrowing it down to these seven. And these are the seven worst with respect to what, like welfare outcomes? And was there an eighth, like at the margin, that didn't quite make the cut? Or? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. You know, no, I had the inequality, then what? Well, unemployment, but then this pe peculiarity of overwork. Did I mention overwork? Oh, yeah. should mention that, because that's another one of these weird contradictions in capitalism. You've got unemployment. But the people that are working are working longer than ever. And some of the data is startling. Okay, there was, you know, a couple of years ago, a survey that Harvard did of professionals that now 94% of professionals work at least 50 hours a week. Uh, almost half work 65 hours a week. And then there was another study, which I'm about the finance industry, and how Goldman Sachs had to pass a rule. Nobody is allowed to work more than 120 hours a week. <laughs> Do the math. Five times 12, five times 24 is 120, because people were doing it and they were breaking down. They're having nervous breakdowns and all this kind of stuff, you know. Uh, because when there's unemployment, you know, there's the threat of losing everything, you know. And if you don't, you know, this competition. If you don't do it, you know, you're going to lose your job. You're going to go from, especially finance. You got to make all this money, but bang, you know, you could just be out of there in, in no time. So that's one of the important craziness. And that's something, by the way, Marx. In, that was one of the insights about Marx. The free enterprise, the market, the invisible hand sets prices, it sets wages, it sets rents, and so on. But one thing it doesn't do, it doesn't set the length of the working day. That's class struggle. You know? and if you think about it, the eight-hour day was first proposed in the United States in 1886. You know? Chicago was the center of that, you know, just before the big Haymarket you know, explosion. It didn't come into being until the 1930s when Roosevelt was able to do it after packing the Supreme Court and getting it you know, through. And it hasn't come down since, in spite of this enormous increase in productivity People are working longer now than they were. I mean, this doesn't make sense, you know. These are the kind of contradictions, you know, the Hegelian faith of Marx is, we'll figure, it's so clearly irrational, we can figure this out, we'll get beyond that, you know, whether we do 
or not in time, you know, remains to be seen. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's easy to bring up like Koch brothers or Goldman Sachs and kind yeah. of these like very conservative capitalists, but what do you think of kind of the tech billionaires that now are proposing um, you know, basic income, you know, and so that's kind of tends to be more supportive because it sounds better. Right. No, no, that's a really interesting, and I think that's a really crucial question because you do have all these billionaires, and they're not all tied to the oil and gas industry. They're not all, I mean, enough of them to fund all these other things. Marx even talks, you know, in the manifesto about, you know, the possibility of certain people of the capitalists going over to the other side when they realize. Now, I do argue, I've argued elsewhere, there is a self-deception that goes on, uh, particularly in the billionaire class, you know, you don't want to think about these things, you know, because if you think about it, you sort of, self-deception, you know, it's an existentialist concept, and it's, it's also very much influenced by existentialism, so this whole project is kind of like that. But the idea of self-deception, you know something, but you don't know it. You know it, but you don't want to know it, you know. And so, for example, you know, I was doing a study of the billionaire, how many billionaires are there involved in the oil and gas industry? Of the top 50, it was only like five were oil and gas. There were a lot more techies. There were a lot more finance people. Well, it's like, why aren't they pouring all their energy into doing something about climate change? Don't they have kids? You know, aren't they worried about the future? You know, and part of it is a lot of self-deception, but not everybody. And that's why, no, I mean, it will be renegades, you know, but they don't want to admit, and which I think is true, is that capitalism is the problem. It's not just this form of capitalism. The whole system that you built your wealth on itself is being called into question. Some of them will go over. You know, how many? Will it be enough? Again, we'll see. 